My name is David Pels. I'm here from uh, the United States, otherwise known as the Kingdom of Donald Trump these days. <clears throat> I uh, told myself I would not talk about politics or religion during this uh, presentation, so I will try to uh, enlighten you with what I've discovered researching this important topic of innovation. And I think today we need innovation more than ever before. <clears throat> when I was invited to speak on this topic, I proposed a couple of options. And uh, I has had quite a lot of uncertainty as to what I wanted to say or could say. I'm certainly not a technologist. I've been involved in project management for 35 years or so on a formal basis. Uh, served on the PMI Board of Directors twice and uh, was an elected a fellow of PMI in 1999, primarily due to my international activities, organizing some global forums and, uh, and reaching out to IPMA and uh, project management associations around the world. By perspectives, I uh, want to uh, delve into some personal aspects of innovation and uh, how it's affected me in my life and then uh, discuss some several other perspectives. For example, uh, where is the most innovation around the world? In which countries? It doesn't matter how old you are in your age as to whether you can be more innovative or less. Are men more innovative than women? And some issues like that. And as I got into preparing this presentation, it occurred to me and it became clear that I needed to have some results. That is, I needed to come up with some ideas or some suggestions for improving innovation or stimulating some innovation. So over the course of this presentation, you will see both some concepts, some hopefully information, interesting uh, uh, things, and uh, some suggestions. First, however, I really want to congratulate uh, the Institute uh, ISIPM. I think 10 years ago you didn't exist and now you're one of the largest in the world. It's really fantastic. And uh, for this uh, conference, again, one of the largest in the world already. 1,700 people attending an event is an enormous accomplishment. So congratulations. It's really uh, great to be here and an honor actually. And I appreciate how your institute is reaching out to the stakeholders of project management in Italy. It's really an important uh, aspect of, of, a, of a national project management association or one that is focused on the interests of your uh, countrymen and your government and your industries. <clears throat> it's nice to be back in Rome and to begin, I want to take you and myself back in history just a few years. Rome in 1970, the first time I visited your city. I was 20, my first visit to Rome. I came by train with a backpack and a map and a book. A book was titled Europe on $5 a Day. I hiked around Europe for three months, but came to Rome knowing no one in Italy. I had no credit card. I had no cell phone. Internet didn't exist. No computer. For three months, basically no one in the world knew where I was. Most of the time, I didn't know where I was. I was exploring. Every day was a an adventure. So here I was in 1970, a 20-year-old. So how many of you were born after 1970? 
Very good. This picture is a little bit blurry because it has a uh, passport stamp right in the middle of the face, so I apologize for that. But at 20, what were we? Curious, creative, playful, energetic, unafraid, adventurous, and certainly constantly learning. I took a semester off of uh, university to, to uh, come to Europe, and of course most of us at 20 were engaged in uh, our education. But this led to me to my first idea that I want to propose, that is to think young, be curious, be creative, be adventurous, and be unafraid. I think that's what is at the heart of innovation, is to just think ahead, go for it, don't worry about it. And what's the number one thing most young people want to do all of the time? No, not risky behavior. Have fun. You need to be having fun in life. So that's my first uh, suggestion. Maybe it won't hurt, help anybody, but... <clears throat> so thinking more about innovation, I thought it would be a good idea to start with some definitions. So I went to some online sources, uh, dictionaries and so forth, and uh, settled on the Oxford uh, Online Dictionary. And of course, uh, I didn't learn in too much from this. Uh, we all know what innovation means. Make changes in something, uh, make something more useful or more uh, newer or renewed. But something jumped out at me from this definition. And it too took me to Rome. The Latin roots of this these words. Now, what is it about Latin? Of course, it was spoken in ancient Rome. But I studied it in high school for two years in the, in the 60s. How is that possible to be speaking an ancient Roman language in 1966? So I did some research on the history of Latin and the history of other languages around the world. And Latin is really a fascinating topic, in my opinion. And how is it uh, related to inno innovation? I would suggest that it's been one of the most innovative languages in history, the, the language of innovations in art and science and uh, war and uh, politics and uh, you, you name it, so many things. And it evolved over the years. Of course, most of you know that, living in Rome, but it started uh, with the Roman Republic, uh, became classical Latin in the, during the early years of the Roman Empire. And then something called vulgar Latin. Of course, most, uh, most people in those days could not read or write, and so they spoke a Latin in the street that was called the vulgar Latin, at least that's what I learned. And that, in the Middle Ages, that morphed into, began to morph and did morph into the romantic languages of Italian, Spanish, Romanian, French, and so forth. <clears throat> And it's still spoken today in a number of industries. We use Latin words in, in America, in law, in uh, archaeology, in biology, in other sciences, in medicine. And that just seems remarkable to me. The mother of the romantic languages, what does that mean? I think there are 35 modern languages based on Latin. 800 million people speak it as their mother tongue. And another, if you throw in English, which although is uh, supposedly a Germ Germanic language, uh, 
55 or 60 percent of its uh, words come from Latin or the Romantic languages. You throw in English and it's uh, two and a half million people around the world speaking Latin-based uh, language. It's unbelievable to me. So what's my second idea? This really got me thinking about language and the importance of language and communication. We hear about communication all the time in the project management field, but we really don't focus on language, the language of your team. And in uh, multicultural, multinational teams, it's really critical. Think about the meaning of words, but also timing, tone, context of language. Know your team's channels, their wavelength, their bandwidth. Are you and your team speaking the same language? How can you innovate if, you, if you're not talking the same language? It's really, I think, important. So that's my second great idea. How can I come to Rome without thinking about ancient Rome, the Roman Empire, and the innovations that occurred 2,000 years ago? Some things we, some innovations from the Roman Empire we're all very familiar with. Uh, Massimo, you mentioned the roads to me last night when we were talking. Roads the Romans built are everywhere in Europe, still, still there in many cases. But the use of arches to balance the weight for larger structures and aqueducts, mo moving water, drinking water from the hills to the cities, these are well known. <clears throat> Some other things, the multi-story buildings, I didn't realize that uh, the Roman, Romans were building apartments, apartment buildings, multi-story apartment buildings in uh, 200 AD. And I think for the first time in the world. Of course, the uh, snail formation, something we all use in our teams, right? I don't, I don't think so, but the uh, Roman numerals, you see those on giant clocks all over, the, all over the world. But some innovations we're less familiar with, and maybe this will, some of these will come as a surprise to you all. The Romans uh, innovated in the use of surgical equipment and, uh, and, and surg surgical procedures. Of course, the first thing I think of is the Caesarean section, but I'm not sure that was inv invented by the Rome Romans. It was, I think it was a uh, rumor that Caesar was delivered by surgery, but in any case, it's now associated with the Roman uh, Empire. Newspapers, although there, were no, no pa there was no paper, the Romans would put the daily or weekly news chiseled into stone someplace in the public uh, arena where they could be uh, read by the citizens. Rather than piles or uh, chambers of rolled up uh, uh, parchment uh, papers, uh, they bound, bound books in Dakotas. And of course, in, in architecture, and I'll mention that again in a moment, but, uh, and, and we don't really like to think too much about wastewater treatment, but it's, a, it's an issue in every city, and it was in, in Rome in, in 100 AD. Ancient Rome, every, every state, every country, I think, has a Senate. We do in the United States. Where did that come from? But the implications are unbelievable today. The, the, what the Romans were doing in their uh, administration, in their law, is still used many places in the world. Public administration, developments in religion, of course, uh, that goes on. And Latin is still in, in use 2,000 years later. There was a, a book, actually, a, uh, some writings by a Roman architect uh, about uh, 20 BC, I think. It became known as the Book of Architecture, which laid out the principles, many of the principles that have come down through history, that many buildings and uh, engineering and architectural work has been based on. <coughs> 
innovations in Roman architecture included vaults, vaulted ceilings, arches, and concrete. And this last innovation that I mentioned is the one that is gaining new uh, respect. That is, why are some Roman buildings still standing 2,000 years later? Does, does anybody really know? It turns out the Romans developed a superior concrete. It's superior to Portland cement that's been used around the world for 200 years. Now Roman concrete has understood why. We, we now know why it was made from uh, volcanic ash, lime, and seawater. And even underwater, it became stronger with age. There were some chemical reactions going on in Roman concrete that made it stronger the longer it lasted. And today, it's considered superior for a couple of reasons, one of which you can create it at, I think, 900 degrees uh, Fahrenheit rather than 1600, so it takes much less carbon, much less heat, putting out less, uh, less impact on global warming. So that's, uh, there's another environmental reason to revert to Roman concrete in, in one form or another. So why do I mention these innovations from ancient Rome? Here's my third idea. Know the underlying value of your product or your project or your process or organization. That is, why does it exist in the first place? Don't reinvent the wheel. These are long-standing proverbs for a, for a reason. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And do teach old dogs new tricks. In other words, remember Roman concrete. <clears throat> so moving forward, let's uh, move through history a little bit uh, and uh, see where did innovation occur? Let's start with ancient Egypt. Unbelievable evidence of innovation still exists and there are being uncovered every, every, every year. In fact, I think this month there, was, there were some more uh, discoveries in some tombs in uh, Egypt. <clears throat> the dynasties in China. And these are periods of time that lasted hundreds of years, so there was time for significant historic developments. <clears throat> the great uh, Roman Republic and Empire lasted what? Nearly a thousand years. It's unbelievable. And the Persian Empire in, in Iran, where significant develops in mathematics and science occurred. We don't really hear about that very much, but I can guarantee you, you learn about that in Iran and uh, the Middle East. Islamic Golden Age lasted, lasted for 500 years. I think this uh, more or less uh, corresponded to the Dark Ages in Europe, but it wasn't dark in other parts of the world. The Renaissance here in Italy, unbelievable architecture and art and writing and, uh, and other things were developed. The Industrial Revolution, further west in England and then in the United States. There have been surveys recently in the United States among scientists and, uh, and others that a result of which is there's a feeling that the years around mm, the late 19th century, early 20th century was more innovative than it was today when Thomas Edison and uh, J.P. Morgan and the big industrialists were really proving, uh, uh, pushing developments in, in American in industry. And of course we have the developments of the last 20 years that we've all been uh, benefiting from. So what now? 
industry 4.0? Is, is that it? Is there something else that we should be aware of? <clears throat> what is industry 4.0? I look at the World Economic Forum website and the results of their uh, periodic meetings and their studies and their committees uh, sometimes, and they have some very interesting uh, information about Industry 4.0, but clearly uh, it involves embedded computing and the Internet of Things that we're uh, hearing about. We had a, uh, a conference in, in Dallas in May, and we had the chief, uh, chief technologist or chief engineer from Toyota North America. They recently moved their corporate headquarters to the Dallas area, and he was speaking about the technology that they're uh, working with in the automotive industry, embedding computing and smart technologies into automobiles, but also the interaction with, with uh, traffic control systems, with other vehicles, with bridges and with the infrastructure, and uh, it's really unbelievable what's happening in automotive tra transportation around the world in this particular area. Big data, analytics, cloud computing, cyber systems, decentralized decision making, moving into the artificial intelligence area, blockchain. This is a really interesting phenomena that's uh, occurring where you're really harnessing the intelligence and the contributions of thousands of people in the development of uh, a product or an idea. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence. Many others. For example, 3D three, three computing is one of the really fa fascinating new, new developments because as that is in advancing, there are now uh, tests and uh, experiments related to uh, transporting uh, artificial limbs and uh, maybe some biological things. In any case, the changes are really dramatic that are uh, happening in the environment around our projects. But beyond Industry 4.0, there are developments going on in many other industries and fields that are really fantastic. Gene editing and genetic engineering is uh, maybe biology of the future. Revolutionary new materials based on nanoengineering and nanotechnology. <coughs> Biological computing. Quantum computing, these things are shockingly per becoming more pervasive. In medicine, the uh, innovations and the trends and the new developments are really changing the way disease and uh, operations and surgeries and medical treatment is occurring. I mentioned 3D printing. Smart renewable energy technologies, not just in uh, renewable energies, but in uh, energy storage, energy trans transportation, batteries, things like that. <clears throat> the pain pace of change is accelerating. We all know this. This is old news already. <clears throat> but the one that I'm really uh, a little bit worried about is AI. This is a graph I pulled from an old uh, Wikipedia uh, article showing the development of computing power over the last uh, few decades. And it, it basically indicated that by 2020, supercomputers will have the ability to uh, simulate the entire thinking ability of a single human being. of all human brains by 2050. That's a total, that's a really freakish 
uh, thing to think about. With unknown, and I would like to suggest some likely unintended consequences. You know, when I was younger, I read a lot of uh, science fiction, and uh, Isaac Asimov and uh, Ray Bradbury used to write stories about computers or, or about uh, robots 50 years ago. And I think that uh, I think it's coming true. So my fourth idea is pretty obvious. We need to think about the future, study significant trends, expect disruptive events or developments, anticipate and embrace change because it's coming whether you like it or not and it's coming fast and who knows what that change is going to bring. I've always liked the uh, reference to uh, Murphy's Law that some of you are familiar with but I would suggest that he's right. If it can happen, it will. <clears throat> Myth or reality? Youth are more in innovative. Most of you will recognize these five uh, innovators, the founders of Microsoft and Apple and Facebook and Google and uh, and uh, Amazon, they, they created these companies, they, they had their bright ideas when they were in the, their 20s, I think uh, maybe Bill Gates was 19, I'm not sure, but uh, it's, it's really led, and my apologies, there are five American companies, but the, these companies are huge now. These companies in particular and others like them have really given rise to the perception that it's those in the 20s that are coming up with all their, all these fantastic world-changing innovations that you have to be in your 20s or 30s in order to really change the world. Well, here are these same guys in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s still innovating. Bill Gates at Microsoft is now one of the most innovative philanthropists and he's leading charges to combat disease and education around the world, lack of education. The late Steve Jobs came back to Apple and changed that company. It's now one of the largest in the world and one of the most successful. <clears throat> Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, I th he's in the middle of his career but he's what, 15, 20 years older than when he started? And maybe his next uh, uh, claim to fame will be uh, information security. I doubt that, but it's possible. Of course, Jeff Bezos at Amazon was just uh, uh, ranked the world's richest person. And he's, what, in his 50s, I think? So what is it? Some older people have been famously innovative in history. And these are just uh, some examples. Some of my favorites, Albert Einstein and uh, Walt Disney and Marie Curie, Isaac Newton, Thomas Edison, Galileo. Well, here's a young, younger guy, uh, Richard Branson. He's still at it at 60. He's trying to take tourists into outer space. And maybe the king of all innovation, right here in Rome, Leonardo da Vinci, and in Milan, and elsewhere in, in Italy. But one of the things I'd like to do is go to the da Vinci Museum while I'm in Rome here this week, this weekend. But let, let's look at some other measures of innovation related to age. Some research coming out of MIT was really fascinating to me. They studied uh, new ventures and their success rates related to the age of the founders. 
and they studied a lot, a lot of them. What they found was that the average age of founders that survived to hire at least one person was 41.9 years. The average age of founders that grew to be successful make, and making money was 45. This is the average. Another study out of MIT was, uh, found some similar information <clears throat> and came up with some, uh, some reasons why. G generally, younger people are certainly more familiar with mobile technologies and the internet and social media and things like that. So they're clear they clearly have an advantage related to some of these newer technologies. But translating ideas into in innovation and successful projects and business requires collaboration. It requires uh, knowledge of finance and marketing and operations and other technologies. This study found the average age of successful ventures to be 39, which is uh, quite a bit older than Bill Gates was when he started. And that there were twice as many founders over the age of 50 than under the age of 25. The young have great, outrageous ideas, but older people <laughs> seem to have more business success. This was a, so, so I think the first bullet here is pretty obvious, that if you're working in a fairly complex field or an or organization that involves cross-functional collaboration or even uh, uh, multiple uh, technologies or multiple scientific uh, applications, you need to take advantage of uh, experience and a little more uh, knowledge. And some indicators say that uh, innovation innovators are getting older. There was a study of uh, Nobel Prize winners, and what that study found was that over the last uh, century, the age of at which Nobel Prize winners did their most important work has increased by six or seven years. Myth or reality, the most innovations today are in IT. Yes, IT is a driving force in, in innovation in many industries, and there are tremendous innovations occurring in IT. Semiconductors and uh, software innovations are leading to new things, new ideas, new technologies, new applications in many, many industries. <clears throat> but it's not just IT. In fact, IT is sort of an enabler. It's not just the innovations in IT, but the innovations that can occur with IT that are really changing many industries and fields. Agriculture, you've got drones being used for all kinds of purposes now. You've got, uh, uh, for example, um, satellite information being used for in, in agriculture. And, and pick, a, pick an industry, really, and there is some technology that is really driving it faster into more change more rapidly. All innovations can benefit from, from innovation. I think that's the message here. Myth or reality? Men are more innovative than women. I had to run this uh, whole set of slides by my wife, and she, she agreed. So you're getting the real, some real information. The fact of the matter is, th is throughout history, men have controlled everything. <clears throat> access, to, access to education, politics, industry, jobs,
Maybe innovations have been more prevalent in men because of that control. In any case, the average ratio of men to women is basically 50-50, or, or of women to men is 50-50. There's generally, I think, about 49.8% of the world's population are women, but it goes way up after the age of 65. but only about 37% of the world's working uh, population are female. And that, it's, uh, it's up to 46% in the U.S. It's probably something similar to that in Italy, but in many parts of the world it's not. And, and generally there's still a huge wage gap. These are a couple of interesting charts that shows the uh, the one on the left shows employment versus uh, management positions of women. And on the right, the, the name of that uh, graph is when jobs are scarce, men should have more rights to them. And these are country rankings, but you can see that men have advantages in many parts of the world simply because of their uh, gender. Gender equality reduces female contributions to industry and society. But the world is changing. Women now average 56% of graduate students in the United States, 60%. Women achieve something like 45%, 40% of all graduate degrees in the sciences with a heavy concentration in biology. And I think some of the, most of these statistics are related to the United States, but some careers are really already dominated by women. And that, that includes some directly related to projects and project management. For example, uh, maybe it's the next slide that shows that women are really gaining ground in procurement and purchasing and accounting and finance. <clears throat> in other words, men's domination in these, some of these fields is is declining. Women are, are rising, but why, why, why shouldn't they be? If they're 50 percent of the human resources on the planet and we're, we're in need of more resources, why it, not, not using 50 percent of our resources makes no sense to me. So the answer to the first question is yes, of course men have been more innovative over history, but there's no reason that they are. No, no, no good reason why they are. In, in, in my opinion. So here's another question. Myth or reality? Are Americans and Europeans the most innovative? <clears throat> well, obviously, technology is spreading around the world. It's a global economy. You know, there's, everybody's got a smartphone. The internet is faster in Korea than it is anywhere in the world. So what, is, what does this mean? We've already seen that there have been periods of great innovation in different parts of the world, whether it's China or the Middle East. Uh, you go back and far enough in history and you'll find great empires in, uh, in Africa and in South America and in Mexico. The World Economic Forum has uh, been holding uh, their meetings in various parts of the world, uh, most recently last month in Vietnam. Before that it was in, uh, in in Brazil and in India last October. In other words, they are trying to capture what is going on economically with technology, with innovation, with uh, solving global problems around the world. And, and it seems to me there's a lot going on in some of these other countries. 
And it's clear to me that innovation and economic development or economic development really requires innovation. So you think about the BRICS, but certainly the size of China and India and Brazil, their populations in their economies, they're going to be innovating fast and, and faster and, and growing because of it. In Japan, related to the project management profession, their national standard has the word innovation in it. The program and project management for enterprise innovation is the name of their standard. They focus on innovation in the con or focus on project management in the context of innovation and changing organizations. In the Global Innovation Index, recently, 2018, of the top 25, number five was Singapore. 12, 13, and 14 were uh, Korea and Japan and Hong Kong. China is rising all the way to 17. It's true that the rest of the top 25 were America and European countries. But it's interesting to note that Switzerland is number one in this ranking. So it's true that according to this ranking, and I'm not sure quite all the uh, bases for the, for the index, but you can look it up and you can see where Italy stands and where other countries uh, rank. It's true that America and Europeans have been more innovative in the last uh, probably century than other parts of the world, but it's changing rapidly. I was, uh, I think I met somebody from Switzerland last night. Is he in the audience? So congratulations to Switzerland for being the most innovative country uh, according to that ranking. But the message from these, uh, these discussions for me is that anyone can innovate, whether you're male or female, young or old, located in Europe or San Francisco or uh, New Delhi, that it is in fact happening everywhere. And that anyone, anywhere can and will innovate. And I think that's the important message, that you don't need to worry about where you live or who you are, how old you are, just uh, find, you, find your way. Now this is an interesting question, myth or reality. Does innovation require a single person to have a, a bright idea to change the company, to change the product or the technology? And the answer is no, because innovation is actually a process, not a bright idea. And I found a very good model which has uh, four, four places in this process. One, yes, it does take someone to have a bright idea, but it takes, generally it takes some help to move that idea forward, to see how it can be applied, to help put a plan together, to help maybe envision a project for making that innovation a reality. And generally, it takes somebody to, to analyze it, to ask questions, to become uh, the devil's advocate and ask, uh, what if something happens, or why, why do this in the first place? And then secondly, it takes somebody to actually make it happen. Successful innovation requires execution. You can't have just a bright idea and have innovation that makes a difference. It has to be executed. So this is my sixth bright idea, that is, innovation takes a team. Not all bright ideas are good ideas. Unimplemented ideas become dead ideas, and teamwork can quicken innovation. Teamwork leads to innovation projects. Now, this leads me to innovation and project management. I need to uh, make some comments. So I bring greetings from Russ Archibald. He may have been your first uh, PM Expo uh, speaker some years ago. He's uh, an award winner and an uh, honorary member of ISIPM, and 
He was in Dallas. He's now 94. He'll be 95 in January. He was in Dallas uh, earlier this month for a heart for some heart surgery. I had the opportunity to spend some time with him. You may know him by his book, Leading and Managing Innovation, What Every Executive Needs to Know About Program Project and Portfolio Management, translated into an, to Italian, and I think you all have uh, seen that book uh, for many years. Anyway, innovation requires projects and project management. If you, if you can't implement an innovation, innovative idea, it's probably not going to go anywhere. That is, project management allows innovation to be executed, implemented, and, uh, and, and valued. Portfolio management, of course, just allows these innovative projects to be prioritized and then organi organized and managed uh, for implementation. So I wanted to say thank you, Russ Archibald, for this. It wasn't his concept, but he really highlighted it and moved it forward in his book. And uh, <laughs> innovation and project management. If every, pro if every project is unique, then innovation is always required. This seems logical to me. Projects create unique products and services. Projects involve new and unique conditions. Innovative projects always involve innovative leadership and project management. Organizational culture, infrastructure, and leadership must also support innovative PM. Successful innovation requires change, no matter what industry you're in. Project management is change management. There's some debate about that, but here's my eighth idea. That is, innovation is a normal aspect of project management. Don't sweat it, just do it. It's not magic. Why are innovative projects initiated? To create a new product or service, to implement organizational strategies, to create benefits and value for stakeholders. That's what it's all about. Successful innovation benefits stakeholders. You'll hear more about that from uh, Massimo in a minute. But I say, get to thank you from your stakeholders with your innovations. So, idea number nine, focus on stakeholders. Innovate with a purpose. Make someone happy. Innovation and agility can overcome VUCA. Are you all familiar with the VUCA concept? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, the new reality. This was made uh, sort of... Uh, uh, better known by the U.S. military uh, about uh, six or eight years ago. But there's another VUCA that's being promoted, vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. That is, innovative innovation can find solutions, but ag agility is needed to get to success, especially to in today's fast-changing world. We had a, a conference in Dallas in May, as I mentioned, and one of the keynote speakers then, in fact, the theme was also innovation at our conference in Dallas. One of the speakers was a well-known uh, uh, leadership uh, uh, educator, uh, Robert Kaplan. He's currently the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank. He was formerly an associate dean at the Harvard Business School and the author of several books on leadership. And he said something really profound that I, I found the most important thing that he said. Someone asked him a question, what's the most important trait for an effective leader? And he said, an openness to learning. It's really great. So my idea 10 is keep learning. Here's a continuous learning model. Study trends, analyze data, benchmark, talk to stakeholders, 
Consider new ideas and concepts, new PM tools and technologies, lessons learned. Listen, read, learn, lead. That's my uh, advice to leaders who want their teams to be innovative. Here's something I thought of uh, as I was concluding this presentation. A sort of a dilemma, that is, if organizations really want to become more innovative, they have to act innovatively to get there. How, how do you act innovatively if you're not innovative? It's a, it's a dilemma. Our secret, project managers already do act innovatively. So think about that, and if your executives are asking, what should we do, tell them what you do. So the last topic is uh, related to passion. Our colleague uh, Al Alfonso Buquero in, in Madrid, Spain, talks about this a lot. This is a quote from a recent article he did in the PM World Journal. And it says, uh, develop your enthusiasm and apply your passion to manage the, the people involved in your projects. And this leads me to an idea number 11. Fall in love again with your product, your project, your process, your organization. Care about your partners and your team. Do what you love, love what you do. That's a good message to work by. Passionate leaders create passionate stakeholders. Now the last time I was in uh, Last time I was in Rome, and my wife and I were here in, in ten, 10 years ago. And did I mention that I was here with my wife? My, the love of my life is here in the front row. Uh, Carla, we're here. We're going to be here for a few, more, a few more days. And I thought, what are we going to do in this beautiful city for the next three days? There's a saying in America, maybe it's everywhere in the world, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. We're going to innovate. Thank you.